From Pushkin Industries, this is Deep Background, the show where we explore the stories behind the stories in the news. I'm Noah Feldman, and we are still talking about coronavirus. In particular, we're going to talk today about the interaction between the virus and the economy. How soon can we go back to work? How safe will that be? How unsafe will we be if we don't look out for the economy? To discuss these very difficult issues, I spoke to Paul Romer, a Nobel-winning economist at New York University. He used to be the chief economist of the World Bank, and he's been thinking hard about this subject. Paul, thank you very much for joining me. I want to start with a very influential essay that you and Alan Garber, the provost at Harvard, published in the New York Times, where you were the first, I would say, serious people to put in a major public venue the economic concerns about what we do about coronavirus on a par with the public health concerns or in relation to the public health concerns. Describe to me, if you will, your current thinking on that very challenging question. Yeah. I I mean, to be honest, I think there were a lot of people who were recognizing the size of the economic cost that we were going to bear. I I think what was distinctive about our op-ed was a very specific proposal about how to craft a middle ground where we get out of this trap where we either have to kill the economy or kill lives. So if if I can, let me just try and explain the basics of the challenge here. Please do. There's this notion of the replication rate. If one person is infected, how many new people does that person infect? Right, that's what people call the R0 or the R0, yep. R0, R0, or the replication rate. That number has to be less than one to keep the pandemic in check. If it goes above one, then it just grows like wildfire. Social distance is one way to get it below one, but of course it's really hurting the economy. The way to keep it below one that is guaranteed to work is find the people who are infected and isolate them. Now, right now what we're doing is we're isolating everybody because we don't know who's infected. So all we need to do is switch to a strategy where we're testing everybody with regularity. As soon as we find somebody who's positive, we have them go into isolation for, say, two weeks. And that's all it takes to get on a path where this this pandemic is dying out. And we can stick with that policy as long as it takes to get a vaccine, which is the other way to protect ourselves. So all it takes is to figure out who it is who's infectious and to isolate them without isolating lots of people who could otherwise just go back to daily life and work. I am not an epidemiologist and I want to be you know, clear about the, the caveat to that, to that effect, but I want to ask a question that's informed by my conversations with epidemiologists and what I'm reading, and it's this. Under circumstances where we already have community spread, unless everyone were tested nearly every day, isn't there a substantial risk that even testing every week or every 10 days, which requires a tremendous number of tests, much greater than I think it seems realistic, at least according to what I've read, for us to be able to produce yeah. in the next few months, would leave yeah. open the possibility of continued spread? I mean, your your key line is, all we have to do is, but the question is, yeah. you know, is that in fact doable? We don't want to be the, the people in the punchline sure. of the economist joke who assume yeah. the can opener. No, I, I, I hear you. And this is a good way to, to phrase the question. Here's the way I would respond to the epidemiologists. It's that you guys are supposed to be the ones who take the numbers seriously. So do the numbers here. What they're saying is something like, oh, we can't get enough testing. So, oh my gosh, you'd have to test people every, every day. That's just not true. All you have to do is do the numbers here. If you tested people on average about once every two weeks, and even if your test has what they call a false negative rate, you fail to catch some people who are actually infectious, um, even under those circumstances, you can get R0 below one. And I'm, I'm really disappointed and, and want to challenge them. Why do they switch into this kind of know-nothing mode of that just won't work? And then they, the ones who claim they're the ones who do the math, they just stop doing the math. Now, let me be clear about what it would mean to test people on average about once every two weeks. 
This means running about 20 million tests a day. That is a huge expansion in the testing capacity that we have. In, it's never been the case that public health authorities had the kind of resources to do that kind of testing. So I understand why they're saying it's not possible. But just think about other cases where we've done something like this. The TSA screens about 5 million Americans a, a day. And, you know, you could have imagined a time before 9-11 where people were saying, oh, my God, you could never screen all people who get on airplanes. That's just impossible. And, you know, so we have to, like, stop flying because we, we might have a terrorist attack or something, you know. If we're serious about scaling out to millions a day, we've got this economy that could produce $20 trillion worth of value. We've got 160 million workers. We could organize ourselves to administer 20 million tests a day. It's really not that big a challenge. It isn't something that was ever available to public health authorities before, but we could easily decide to do it now. And I really want to just insist, and I'm going to get aggressive about this, the epidemiologists can't just go into know-nothing mode and dismiss this without actually doing the math and engaging seriously. So I think that many epidemiologists that I know, at least, would say it's not that we're not doing the math at all. They, they say, you know, we live on math. We're not ignoring the math. I think that's the first thing they would say. The second thing I think they would say is that they have to recognize not the normative claim that we ought to or we might be able to generate 20 million tests a day, but rather the predictive claim, because they engage in minute-to-minute -minute prediction too, of whether this particular president with this particular configuration of economic forces facing him is even plausibly capable of doing what you think we normatively ought to do. And I think someone would say, we concede that it would we should have 20 million tests a day. I've not heard any epidemiologist saying, oh, it doesn't matter about the tests. Yeah. They all say, we need the testing. Yeah. We need it in a very serious way. Yeah. But if they have a different assessment of the empirical probabilities. Well, yeah, let me, let me just say, I, you know, I understand that. But I think people have to, you know, stick to their the area of expertise. They understand the math of these models. They're not experts in politics, public expenditure, mobilization. I don't think they're the ones who should make for everybody the judgment about what's politically feasible. And then worst of all, having made that judgment, hide it behind some phony assertion like you'd have to test people every, every day. What they should say, I think, is the same thing I'm saying, which is like, look, if you want to be sure you're below, with R0 below one, at any level of prevalence in the United States, you're going to need to test uh, something like 20 million people a day. And then let's leave it to others to figure out if setting ourselves up to do that kind of testing would actually be less costly than continuing to do what we're doing to the economy. I think some epidemiologists, at least privately, worry that if they say more or less what you're saying, that that's an invitation to the Trump administration to say, even without the 20 million tests a day, we can, you know, return to greater degree of normalcy. And that if that happens, it could genuinely lead to a public health disaster. Yeah, but let me just jump in, just head Please. on in this, because this is exactly the thing I've been saying to economists. I would say exactly the same to anybody in science. You cannot tell people things that are just factually untrue because you think that the political spin is such that we'll get better outcomes that way. And let me give you a very clear example of how this is coming back to bite us. The WHO and some supporting authorities said, oh, masks don't help, so don't use masks. Now, it's just not true. If you got everybody who goes out in New York City, for example, to wear a mask, that could reduce R0. The reason they said something that wasn't true is because they were worried, quite reasonably, that we don't have enough masks, they were worried if people ran out to buy masks, we wouldn't have masks for the people in the hospitals who need them the most. But it was a huge mistake to say something that was misleading, bordering on being false, to try and achieve a good outcome. What scientists need to do is stick to what's true, protect our credibility, and then tell others, well, given that it's true that masks will protect people, 
you may face a sudden surge in the demand for masks. You better move right away to make sure that your hospital workers have the masks. They get the first in line to get those masks. But we just should have stuck to the truth there. And my answer to the epidemiologists right now is the same. I don't see any danger in saying consistently, if we test on the scale of 20 million people a day and we isolate everybody who's positive, everybody else can return to work and we can contain this pandemic. And if you need to, go on and say, if we just start sending people to work without testing, without any strategy for identifying who's positive and isolating them, we will kill hundreds of thousands of people. I just don't see why those are hard statements to make clearly and directly to the public. We'll be back in just a moment. I want to ask you about this potential disciplinary gap that you're describing, and maybe I should be more aggressive and say maybe there's even a disciplinary war that's emerging. And roughly speaking, there are the epidemiologists, most of whom also have MDs, as well as new degrees in public health or statistics, on the one hand. And on the other hand are economists. And each is sort of in his or her element because the public health epidemiologists are spending their whole lives studying what happens when disease spreads, and disease is greatly dangerous and is spreading. And the economists spend their whole careers studying what happens in, especially if people do macro, studying the rise and fall of economies. And our economy is now in a kind of a, a free fall. Each says, my disaster is very, very bad and needs to be taken seriously. And there's a kind of struggle going on, it sounds like perhaps, this is a hypothesis, over which struggle is the greatest, which challenge is the greatest, where the priorities should lie. And there also may be some epistemological differences because the epidemiologists are accustomed to thinking about avoiding harm and, and they don't spend a lot of time thinking about costs and benefits. And in contrast, the economists' whole undertaking is to think about costs and benefits. Is, does that resonate at all with what you're observing? I think there's a lot of truth in what you, you said there. So I, I, I don't disagree with that at all. Um, I also think it's important to rem remember that I think everybody, the, the vast majority of people operating in these different camps are doing so with good intentions and in good faith. So this isn't a case of, of bad actors. I think it is hard to appreciate the perspectives and the arguments of others. Uh, but let me just say that, you know, Alan Garber is actually an MD and a PhD economist. He's not an epidemiologist modeler, but, you know, he certainly knows those guys. So Alan and I were really, in a sense, trying to bring these two communities together. And the ironic part, if you extend the, you think about the public health people, if you think about what Alan and I are saying, we're saying, in effect, those economists who are telling you all about stimulus and so forth, we're spending way too much on their proposal, and we're not spending nearly enough on the kind of thing that you in public health have been arguing for for so many years. So oddly, you know, on the public health side, we're coming in from the outside, but we're saying, actually, you know, you guys were right, and we should have been spending, you know, billions more on you, and so let's just do it in a hurry. Now, there's a special dimension that makes it a little bit tough in the epidemiological community right now, which is that they have been attacked basically by trolls, who are trying to say that like this Imperial College study with many deaths and some of these other studies were politically motivated. So they've been blindsided by suddenly being pulled into the, the world of the trolls and vitriol and lies, and they don't quite know how to respond. Some of them understandably are feeling defensive. And, you know, at first glance, they may worry a little bit about, well, how do we know that Romer and Garber aren't just, you know, kind of one more, you know, subtle attempt to troll us and undermine our credibility? But here I think what we need to do is just engage and engage on the specifics, take each other's arguments um, seriously. And I think we should be able to all come to consensus around some of these basics. Like, even if we don't know things like prevalence, if we test at a sufficient scale and then isolate the people who test positive, we can get below our zero. And then from the economist side, I think we can say, and this is a policy we can stick with indefinitely. Everybody who tells you, well, I've got this policy, 
And I know it's so damaging that we can't do it for very long, but let's just do it for a little while. And then and then they never say, well, and then we'll do something else. We should be extremely skeptical right now of anybody who says, well, just do this really damaging thing and then we'll make it up as we go. Do you have a view on whether President Trump should be invoking the Defense Production Act in order to compel the kinds of investments that you're talking about? I mean, the analogy to World War II and to other wars is pretty striking here. What the World War II historians are always telling us is that the buildup post Pearl Harbor actually really took a while. You know, that it took a couple of years for the United States to generate the kind of, they they also think that the United States won the war because of its capacity to mobilize production. So don't get me wrong, they're in broad agreement with you, but there's a question of temporality. Um, There's two ways to respond to a question like that. One is, yes, indeed, President Trump should, or President Trump should not. I think we just as economists have to get out of the mode of thinking that we're philosopher kings who can tell somebody else, here's what you should do. You know, and and it takes self-control and discipline. Those are not the right kind of answers to provide. But here's the kind of answer that I think would be helpful. Here's why something like the Defense Production Act might help us ramp up production very quickly. Think about just masks or body suits. We say to a manufacturer, we'd like you to increase the output of your equipment by a factor of 10 so we can get a surge of production in the next few weeks and months to then meet the sudden demand we're facing. And we want you to do it at the same price, uh, sell your goods at the same price you were selling your goods before. Well, the manufacturer then says, listen, you're asking me to buy all this equipment, which will last for like 10 years, and you're asking me to run this uh, equipment for maybe two or three months, six months. The demand might go away, and then I've paid for equipment that could have been producing for 10 years, but I only get to use it for six months, and um, then I'm going to suffer huge losses if I operate that way. So... If the market operated the way we describe it in the textbooks, we just say, oh, okay, well, the market price for a surge in production of masks is like 10 times what the market price was before, and that will help you know, give you an incentive, Mr. Manufacturer, Ms. Manufacturer, to take a risk that you're going to end up with obsolete capital equipment in a few months. But now we have this constraint, which is just a fact, which is that Many people, the vast majority of people, respond moralistically to what they see as price gouging or, um, you know, kind of opportunism. So the reality is we can't let the market do its job with high prices to motivate surge production. So what might work in a case like this is for the government to say, okay, we'll buy the equipment for the production line. We'll rent it to you on a month-by-month basis. You provide the workers, you do the design, the manufacturing, sell the masks at something like the, the prices you sold before. And then if it turns out the demand falls off in a, in a few months, you can stop paying rent on the machines. We, the government, eat the loss of machines that are now obsolete. I think this would be a socially acceptable way to radically scale up production. And the trick here is to avoid the moralistic kind of analysis and just look pragmatically and say, gee, if we're talking about a surge, somebody might bear some costs because equipment becomes obsolete in a few months. And we as taxpayers would like our government to bear that cost because we really want to get this equipment very quickly. And that, I think, could be done either with or without the DPA. The DPA might be an effective way of doing it, but I think there's statutory room for the president to do what you described you know, in a voluntary deal with the companies without having to invoke centralized industrial yeah, control. Yeah, I, I think, and there's just been some lack of clarity. Like, this is all so unfamiliar and we're moving so fast. I think some firms are worried that how the DPA will be used is that some official will say, you have to expand your production of masks. You have to charge the prices from before. In effect, you have to bear the cost of the equipment, which may turn out to be obsolete very soon. So as long as we make it clear that the DPA is really a mechanism for just brokering a deal that is the deal that we as taxpayers and citizens want, but which for a variety of reasons we can't 
allow through a mechanism where we just pay a very high price for production right now. This is just a mechanism that would let us use our government to broker the deal we want, which is fundamentally, we just need the masks as fast as possible. Paul, let me ask you one more question before you go. And this has to do with the relationship between your own academic expertise and trajectory and the work that won you the Nobel Prize and your views in this particular crisis. So at a, at a very gross level of generality, your work's innovation had a lot to do with taking into account in models of macroeconomic growth the way that new ideas, innovations, and technological change actually affect trajectories. Do you find that when you're thinking about this set of problems and you're staking out your own position, that your view may be in some direct way influenced by your sense that, yes, we're in this crisis, yes, there's a trajectory that the epidemiologists and others are predicting, but they're not taking into account the kinds of innovative interventions that could be undertaken of precisely the kind you're talking about? Yeah, I, um, one thing about using Twitter is it does force you to boil things down I sent out a tweet where I said that I've spent my whole career trying to make a single point, which is just because something is unfamiliar, it doesn't mean it's impossible. Now, I mean, who can argue with that? But <laughs> it's something which we don't keep track of, we don't think about. So when somebody says, oh, testing 20 million people, basically, I've never seen that. I have no experience with that. That's so unfamiliar. Oh, that must be impossible. No, actually, it's not impossible. Um, and every time we go down a path where we try and do something new, when we try to estimate, well, how hard is this going to be? It's inevitably much less hard, much less costly than we think, because we discover ways to do it. Once we start trying to do it, we discover ways to do it that we, we never even knew were possible. So I'm not only confident that we could afford to scale out exactly what we're doing right now, but absolutely certain that if we start doing that, we're going to find ways to do it at much lower cost and um, much more quickly, much less disruption than, than anybody uh, imagines right now. And, you know, and you can actually go back and look at various episodes, like how hard is it going to be to reduce sulfur dioxide emissions that caused acid rain? Or um, like, how hard is it going to be to stop using the chlorofluorocarbons, which were destroying the ozone layer? You go back and read that, you know, the literature and the debate before, it was like, this is going to be the end of life as we know it if we don't have chlorofluorocarbons. But, you know, we banned them. We found an alternative. We stopped using them and, you know, as spray deodorant and used roll-on deodorant. You know, there's a almost unlimited, infinite number of alternative ways to do things. But because they're unfamiliar, we tend to think they're not possible. And we need to just lose that kind of fear and commit to, let's go down this path. We don't know exactly how we're going to do it, but we're going to find a way to do it. And once we commit, it'll turn out fine. Paul, thank you very much for your insights. I think your core insight, which you described as spending your career on, that unfamiliarity is not the same thing as impossibility is tremendously valuable in this particular moment. And I want to join you in uh, hoping that we're able to scale up testing uh, and other interventions with the kind of speed and capacity that it would take on, on your account to, to make the interventions that you're talking about. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thanks for being so, you know, so patient with my, my vehemence uh, and my, my arguments. Uh, not at all. That's, that's a sign of passion in a, in a moment when we need, we need lots of that. Talking to Paul Romer was genuinely fascinating for me. The passion with which he expressed his point of view captures, to my mind, the intensity of this moment and the importance of listening seriously to experts of all kinds as we try to chart a course forward. On the one hand, I benefited hugely from hearing the core insight that Paul described as the primary one of his career and for which he won the Nobel Prize, namely that the unfamiliarity of a challenge does not translate into the impossibility of a new and creative response to it. On the other hand, I was a little surprised to discover myself defending the epidemiologists in this conversation against a rather sharp charge that they're not doing the math properly or that they're failing to take into account the capacity of the system to respond and to produce 20 million tests a day. In the end, I think a significant part of the dispute between Paul and the epidemiologists depends on the question of empirical reality, namely, can we actually do this? And on that question, you'd have to be a genuine prophet 
to give a definitive answer. Until I speak to you again, be safe, be careful, and be well. Deep Background is brought to you by Pushkin Industries. Our producer is Lydia Jean Cott, with research help from Zui Nguyen. Mastering is by Jason Gambrell and Martin Gonzalez. Our showrunner is Sophie McKibben. Our theme music is composed by Luis Guerra. Special thanks to the Pushkin Brass, Malcolm Gladwell, Jacob Weisberg, and Mia Lobel. I'm Noah Feldman. I also write a regular column for Bloomberg Opinion, which you can find at bloomberg.com slash Feldman. To discover Bloomberg's original slate of podcasts, go to bloomberg.com slash podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Noah R. Feldman. This is Deep Background.